Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Tierra Thomas, um, class of 2012, and I currently serve as president of the African American Alumni Association here at the university. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Profiles of Inclusive Excellence this evening. The African American Alumni Association was officially established in October 2009, and our purpose is to provide support and networking opportunities for African American alumni of CWRU. We work to provide a forum for the university to recruit students and foster friendship amongst those connected with the university. Before we begin today's program, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, you will find that all of you are muted by default, and we ask that you remain muted to limit background noise during the program. If you have any questions, please utilize the chat feature and we will do our best to get those answered for you. So that we know who you are, um, we welcome you to rename yourself by clicking on participants, finding your name, then using the more option and selecting rename. Finally, we'd love to have your camera on if you can. We'd love to see your smiling faces. So with that, I am happy to welcome you to this installment of Profiles of Inclusive Excellence, which is a virtual series in collaboration with the African American Alumni Association, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusive Engagement, and the Africana Studies Program to highlight the work and research of African American faculty. Our host for this evening will be Dr. Heather Burton. She is Associate Vice President and Senior Director for Faculty and Institutional Diversity with Case Western Reserve, specializing in gender and racial equity. And with that, I now gladly turn it over to Dr. Burton. Thank you, Tierra. Thank you so much. And, and, and welcome to everyone to our Profiles of Inclusive Excellence. Um, we are always excited with this particular series show. I get really excited because I get to learn new things about my colleagues that I typically would not know if I don't ask certain questions. And I get to ask those questions in this space. Um, and so tonight I'm excited because we have Dr. Camille Warner with us. Uh, and before I get into that, I would like to thank uh, VP Robert Solomon, who's on the call. And I have to say, VP Solomon doesn't have to show up for these, but he shows up for them <laughs> every time we have a profile. So I just want to thank my supervisor, my boss, for being here and supporting the Profiles of Excellence. Um, and then I also see uh, many of our Case family on the on the Zoom call this evening. So, Dr. Warner, you've had the opportunity, unlike other guests, to know how we start profiles of excellence. So this won't be a surprise to you, but for those who are joining us, we have this tradition here with profiles of excellence. And we started off by by, by asking a certain question. And that question is based in the movie Brown Sugar with Tay Diggs and Sanai Lathan. And so this movie is set in the whole theme of hip hop. And throughout the entire movie, they talk about when did you fall in love with hip hop? Uh, and Dr. Warner, you were with us last month with, with uh, Brian Addison, with Professor Adamson. And Professor Adamson wouldn't even let me jump into the other question before he actually started talking about hip hop. So I don't want to slight you in case you want to talk about hip hop before we get into anything else. But I'll say, when did you fall in love with hip hop? So I was thinking about this when Dr. Adamson said his response. And I was also a kid. And there was um, a boy down the street who came over. We were all kind of playing in um, my parents' backyard. And he had, you know, back in the 70s, the boom box. And he was playing Curtis Blow's These Are the Breaks. And he kept playing it over and over. And I remember saying, what, what are you listening to? And no sooner had I said that, than I started listening to Curtis Blow, Grandmaster Flash, um, Run DMC. So I grew up with hip hop and I chuckle when they talk about 50 years because it's honestly been a little more than that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I would say that's when I fell in love with it. I didn't know initially. I thought, oh, this is this is different. I don't know what's going on, but I like it. And then there was a time when I pretty much knew most of the lyrics to many rap songs. Um, so, yeah, I, I did kind of fall in love at a young age with hip hop. I, I love it. I love it. And I, I have to say, um, and I, I don't think I've shared this on the profiles previously. So I'll share this on this profile is that. I also love hip hop, thus probably the movie, why I use that to start profiles. But I was even in a rap group 
Oh, okay. See all these hidden yeah. talents. And and not only that, I was a background dancer. So <laughs> Oh wow. You were quite I, serious, Dr. I Burke. was serious about I was serious about my other life, my other career that I could have had. Um, but with that, and that, you know, we always start with that question of when did you fall in love, but we usually use it to your academic area. And sure. for you, the interesting thing that most people don't know is that you have this dual, this dual love, this dual area. Um, and so you have some people who associate you with sociology, but for the most part at the university, many people only know you from the lens of nursing until they talk to you. So in that, I'll let you choose. When okay. did you fall in love with sociology? When did you fall in love with nursing? You can do both or you can do one. Okay. So I've got to do both. I probably should start by how I fell out of love with English. Um, I thought, you know, I love to read, I love to write, and, you know, going in, I was a declared English major um, as a freshman at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and I thought, yeah, you know, this is for me, this is where I want to be. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with it afterwards, but at the same time, I also, of course, I was exploring other courses, and I had a sociology course but it was really, I think, sitting down in one of my English courses and we were going through, no offense to Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales, but I had read it and dissected and synthesized it so many times. And I was also simultaneously taking a course um, in sociology. I, I really enjoyed you know, the 101 that I had taken this huge course, I was probably the only brown person in this really large lecture hall, but I, I loved what I was hearing. And I think it was just kind of a simultaneous moment when I'm like, okay, I can't do any more Canterbury Tales. Although again, I, I, I still enjoyed some of my other English classes, but sociology just really resonated with me. Um, I was so fascinated just about the study of social systems and structures, how people fit into that, um, the behavior of individuals. And I just, I didn't stop. Um, and so I would say it was probably my freshman year in college when I fell in love. Nursing, I fell in love um, with the discipline, probably as a graduate student. Now I will share um, people who know me know that my mom um, was a nurse, a registered nurse, a psychiatric mental health nurse, and she worked very hard. She had a very caring spirit. I mean, she was really, I would say, the perfect person, very compassionate, loved people. Um, but she, she kind of warned my sister and I that nursing is tough and nursing can take a toll on you. So I wasn't told not to do it, but I was encouraged to explore it and be sure that's where I wanted to land. So we kind of joke later in life um, because I ended up being at the School of Nursing. And really, I, I was there because the principal investigator of the study I was on, I had a um, minority research a scholarship which paid for me to be a graduate assistant, held a stipend, but I got wonderful experience. So Marie Howe was the principal investigator. Dr. May Weichel was a co-investigator at the time on that study, and she was in nursing. And the study actually was housed in nursing. So um, there was an opportunity for me to interview um, because I had met with Dr. Howe and she's like, I want you. And, and maybe some of it was because I was a sociology major. I don't know. But we really connected. And she said, come over. I want you to come to the Center on Aging and Health. And you need to meet um, Dr. May Weichel. Also, Dr. Massa Ford from Medicine was on that study. There were a lot of people, Dr. Uh -huh. Carol Muso, who's now our dean of the School of Nursing, Dr. Diana Morris. 
gosh, there were a lot of folks um, who were a part of that. So please forgive me if I've forgotten anyone. And I just, I, I had a family there um, and I was appreciated. I learned so much that I guess that's really kind of where everything kind of came together. So tell us about medical sociology. What's a medical sociologist? Okay, so again, I'm going to go back to my roots. In at Miami University, I had um, a professor, Dr. Uh, John Subedi, who really had um, a really powerful impact on me in terms of, you know, we would we would sit and talk about the course content, and I remember saying, I know I have to go kind of beyond this with this degree because um, I actually had just missed um, and my my friends in social work might appreciate this. I had graduated a semester early and I but I just missed the cutoff to take the social work um, exam and get licensed in social work because I thought, OK, that's what I need to do. Um, I need to get a job. Well, that opportunity was not no longer available. Um, I think they changed the rules in October and I graduated in December. So I spoke to Dr. Subedi. He said, you need to go to case and you need to work with Dr. Marie Haug. That's who you need to work with. So I listened to that. Um, I also listened to some of my other professors who said, you know, look around, see what happens. And I took his advice. And I stepped out on faith because at that time I did not have funding as a graduate student, um, but I was accepted into the program and I was able to work with Dr. Haug and that helped um, fund my education. And the loan I took out for that first semester was more than anything I had in my undergraduate career. Just saying. So, um <laughs> You know, we're working on that. We're working on those things. Yeah, we, we are working on those things. Um, so for our audience, we will take questions from the chat. So if you have any questions for Dr. Warner, please do not hesitate to put those in the chat. Uh, and as we continue, what I want to do, I want to take us back, Dr. Warner. So I want to take us back. Who was young Camille? Hmm. Okay, so young Camille... Uh, was and probably still am a nerd. Um, I was quiet. I really wasn't into sports so much. Um, I mean, I could compete in gym class, but I didn't like the competitiveness and, you know, of, of formal sports per se. But I was in a lot of student groups. Um, academics were really important to me. I, I love to read. So I, I was always in the library and I worked at the library. So I worked in the library when I was in high school and also college. And I actually consider library science as um, a major, too. But, yeah, very quiet, um, but friendly. Once um, people, I think, got to know me and I got to know them, they realized that, well, maybe she's not as, as shy as she appears. And I actually um, do have some things to say once you get to know me. I probably am the classic middle child where I did um, mediation between my older sister and younger brother. Uh, we were four years, we we're all four years apart. And we teased my mom, she was on a college plan. So yeah, I would just say kind of shy, reserved, nerdy. So so where did you grow up? Where, where, where did you grow up? Okay, so I grew up um, in Cleveland, um, Lee and Miles area. And at that time, this was again in the 80s. And so we were going through the desegregation process. So I was still able to walk down the street to Beehive Elementary School, but my sister had to be bused to the West Side. And oftentimes the bus would break down you know, there'd be fights on the bus. They'd never make it to school. It was just pretty chaotic. Um, there were times when there were teacher strikes and that was always awkward sometimes walking to school and you're seeing your teacher on strike. And my parents said, you know, 
let's see, because education was always very important to them. They were concerned. They were concerned about our future. They could not afford for us to go to private schools. My dad worked as a steel worker, and there were times, um, again, back in the 70s and 80s, that was very lucrative and would make more money than my mom at times as a registered nurse. But they couldn't afford to put all three of us in private school. So they thought, okay, what can we do? There's a neighboring um, school district, Shaker, that's a little um, better, they felt at that time. But it was interesting because we lived literally a rock's throw from Kinsman. And at a young age, I knew there was a difference because there was a time when a car, there was a car accident. And literally inches from the Shaker border, but the police came from Cleveland and it took forever. And so those were the kind of things I saw among others that said, you know, this is a stratified system. I knew this, but to see it um, broke my heart. And that's kind of where I grew up. So I, I consider myself, I spent you know, half of my life in Cleveland and half in Shaker. So, yeah, and that and that border is real. That border between that is, the Cleveland Shaker border is real. Um, I spent some time in the Lee Harvard area. Okay, so very <laughs> very familiar. I know it well. I, my twenties was in the Lee Harvard area. My late teens, early twenties. So, how do you think your childhood impacted who you are today? Oh gosh. Immensely. So, and you you know this story, Dr. Burton, and some other folks on the call uh, do as well, but it's been my life. So my mom and my dad got married in 1963. My father grew up in Jim Crow South in Arkansas. My mother uh, grew up in Southern Ohio. She was a white woman. My dad was a black man. So in 1963, interracial marriages were illegal in parts of this country. So I've always had a background where there was a lot of diversity, not only in race, but religious beliefs, sexual identities, uh, socioeconomic statuses, all the things that I guess that's kind of really what led me, you know, to my studies, but I had the lived experiences. And I think, you know, coming from that background kind of uniquely positioned me to handle some things that that are difficult. You know, as a Black woman, um, we were always raised to be proud of who we are and to make sure that you know, everybody, we, we were told, my dad, you know, would tell us every day, nobody's better than you and you're no better than anybody else. And that's really something that has been kind of a guiding light for me, if you will. That in um, my spiritual and religious beliefs, that, that, that really the lens I always look out from. Um, so the judgment and... Um, putting people up and putting people down, that was never for me to do. And I think just appreciating that everybody, there's goodness in everybody. Mm -hmm. And having that kind of kind spirit. Um, I mentioned my mom was a psych mental health nurse. And I remember at the time, my sister and I, we would go out in the community with um, my mom and often it wasn't unusual for some of her former patients to come up to her. So let's just say we're out, you know, at the supermarket and we could see my mom was in this conversation and we'd kind of say, oh boy, mom's talking to, you know, and we'd go the other way. But what that showed us was what you can do in a person's life often goes beyond the context of that situation. So she had helped individuals at their most vulnerable states when they were at their worst. 
Um, and people remembered that. And she she continued to give, you know, outside of the, the workplace. Also, because of my um, background, there was a time, um, again, I said my parents got married in 1963. My grandmother, my maternal grandmother, disowned my mother and did not want anything to do with her, her Black husband, and her Black children. My grandmother, again, grew up in Southern Ohio. As a small child, she remembers being on the shoulders of adults at Klan rallies. That was her lived experience. Also, you have to be mindful of the time that she grew up in. So what happened later is we met my grandmother and she embraced us. Um, she was able to get past or rather my mom was as well, because, you know, you have to understand that that was um, a part of my family. I did not meet until later, a little bit later. And I guess one of the kind of pivotal moments was a time when all three generations, we actually happened to be in Painesville at the time, because that's where my grandmother um, was living. She ended up, she had moved away from Cleveland. She came back and we were at a KKK rally and we were protesting. So I said, if anything can come full circle, here's an example. And I use that to say that you can't lose hope. And because I've seen it in my own life, I have um, always held on to that. Yeah, and, that, and that's a great, you know, great example of how people can change and, and, and holding on to that. And what I want to ask you is that, did you know that you're, as, as a young child, before reconciling with your grandmother, did you know that there was a um, disowning by your grandmother to your mother before that reconciliation? Absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, my mom, um, she's the original ally, if you will. She said, I don't care who you marry. I don't care who you love. I will never turn my back on you. So we, it was all, we grew up in a household where we talked about, we had those hard conversations. You know, we had the conversations about race, about income. Um, we, we talked about it. So that's the one thing I can appreciate is that they didn't sugarcoat for us kids. And we saw things that we knew weren't right. And we also um, talked about them and, and strategized um, about how we can make things better. So yeah, it was never, it was never a secret. And it was just something that, yeah, we, I mean, my parents used it as a teachable moment, and it really was. Yeah, and that that is a teachable moment. Do you think, um, so with your identity, and I know that you identify as a Black woman. Yes. Was that a choice from within the family context, or was that a choice from society? Because we know what tends to happen with biracial children, with multiracial children, and we know historically that one drop identified you as Black. Was that something with this identification that came from within your family or from external? Or how did your mom and dad raise you all in terms of your identification? So I would say um, both, honestly. And there was never a, a question in terms of identity. So it was just, it was just one of those things. Um, you know, I'm... I'm a, a black woman and my mom is white and I, and I love her nonetheless. And she loves me nonetheless. So it really, you know, wasn't anything. And, and, and sure. Part of that I think was, you know, growing up in the seventies and black is beautiful. It's not something that you should be ashamed of and understanding the historical roots. You know, you mentioned the one drop rule, right? And the fact that um, that was a way to claim ownership and, and to have slaves. So we talked about it. And, and also, we're very clear that in this society, people are going to label and view you a certain way. Definitely. And um, 
recognizing that. So for me, it just, again, it's, it's always been something that we talked about. We did. Um, and the only thing I can say um, where my mother was, was ever concerned um, about racial identities per se was when I was a freshman and I'm a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, which is a, a Black Creek letter organization. And I tease Dr. Burton. Um, we're all sisters. We love each other. But because it um, was the first Black Greek letter organization, sorority, that is, um, my mom was concerned that that would be exclusionary. And why didn't I look at other um, sororities? And we actually had a heart to heart about that. And we talked about um, my decision. And she was concerned for other reasons as well, not just that um, reason. But she we were able to talk about it and she understood it. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's interesting. And, and that's what I was just thinking about. And I think it's what, 1967, when it became legal for interracial marriages. And so your parents actually defied even the laws by marrying in 1962. And oh, so absolutely. I'm sure they had their, their, their challenges. Yeah. yeah. And, and then raising three children within that. Um, and I love love the love with that that you demonstrate and that you talk about within the family. And the reason that I asked that question was because very often uh, you probably engage, I know I engage with students who are being forced to choose yes. in terms of how they identify specifically when we're talking about racial identities uh, and because society puts certain things in, in space. And so it's always, you know, that question of what was, what was happening in the household. Right. And, how were you know parents encouraging the uh, the identity and and the racial identification for children? I do want to remind you all that we are taking questions from the chat. So if you have any questions for Dr. Warner, please put those in the chat. Don't hesitate to um, ask her questions. And so as we kind of shift but stay along the same lines, uh, and I think listening to you, this probably has a lot to do with the choice for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and taking on this type of responsibility. But why diversity, equity, and inclusion? Why take on that responsibility in the College of Nursing? I guess my question to you would be, why not? And, you know, again, it goes back to, there are many things that we can do to make a difference. And I, I've always felt that Sometimes you can't wait for everything to be perfect. You know, I used to think that, oh, I have to have, you know, a certain degree or I have to go um, to school X number of years. And I don't think that that's always necessary for you to be positioned to do things that you know are right and important. So I say that to say I was doing work that would fall under that umbrella, whatever you want to call it, social justice work, diversity, equity, inclusion. I try not to get too hung up on the labels. I was doing that in a capacity that wasn't formal, um, if you will. Although, you know, I was a member of organizations, um, obviously part of the Social Justice Institute. I'm happy to say that I have rejoined and doing things that, again, are fall under what um, that umbrella would would cover. But I think sometimes, you know, it's important too to look past the role per se. And I say that because everybody can can participate and do this work. And just because, you know, someone is in the the role or the lead doesn't mean, you know, it stops there or or you know, I've arrived or I'm the, you know, have all things related to DEI. And I know, Dr. Burton, you and I have had this conversation as well. So, you know, I I tend not to to focus on at that aspect of it, but to focus on the work. And when I had this opportunity, I actually felt like this is one of the first times where I can kind of merge all of my passions 
my my work in and outside of the academy and there's actually a role for that and so i also bring up that you know it's i did it when it wasn't in fashion and i don't say that to be malicious just that we've seen the pendulum swing, I think. Um, and we're in a, a situation now that some folks refer to as the post-wokeism era. And it's challenging because there are people who make assumptions about yeah. who you are because of the title or the role that you have. And that's always been problematic for me. Yeah, and I agree, you know, they do. And then they label you and they put you in the box or think that this is all you're capable of, too, which was always my fear uh, in taking on a role of DEI. And I think, um, so since you have taken on this role, um, what has been one of your, of your most rewarding experiences? And what do you see as one of your greatest challenges? Now, that's a question from the chat. Okay, Wow. So that's hard to say because there's been so many great experiences. I still um, love working with students. And in my role, I also cover an aspect of student services where I advocate for students and help them. So I can't directly teach as much because of that. But it's so rewarding when you are able to work with students who appreciate either the programming or just, you know, something that may not have been deemed important for most, but for them really touched them in a way that said, oh, wow, someone is noticing or, or paying attention. And I don't know, I can't put a price on that. Like, I, I love that aspect. The challenge, the challenging part, I would say, is that, you know, you're not going to get everybody on the same page. And for me, I think looking at those goals and those outcomes, that's where I keep my eyes on the prize and being able to say, okay, we may not all agree on things. I believe in diversity of thought, opinion. So having those voices, I love that aspect too, but also knowing that everybody's not going to be happy. And, you know, that's, that's just, that's life, honestly. Yeah. And, and, that, and that is a challenge to the work. It is a challenge that, uh, and we talk about this when you're dealing with human behavior, there's just no that's one right, right way. And so how do you find that, which is, uh, I love the words that Robert always uses, that's a both and versus an either or uh, and getting the work done. Um, and so I do have another question from the chat, kind of okay. along the lines of you taking on this administration role. Sure. And so when you think about this and your shift from faculty to administration, uh, the question is, what were you, what were some of the surprises what were you surprised about? And then what do you enjoy um, with this, this, this shift from faculty to administration? That's a great question. So surprising, so many meetings, so many meetings, my goodness, who knew? <laughs> um, right, that's what I say. <laughs> that's what I say every day. And with that, it's like the you still have to work. Like you're talking about the work you need to do in those meetings, but you need the time to do it. So that was a, a surprise. Also, I think some people think with that admin title, they should, they may be a little worried and, and worried in the sense that can I still talk to Camille, the way I talked to Camille when she was faculty, or do I now have to speak with her differently? And negotiating that, that, that was um, a little surprising to me. And, and I say, I, obviously, we all grow, develop, evolve, but I still think of myself as that nerdy little kid that we were talking about earlier. So I would say that would be some of the surprises I had and 
Um, excuse me, what was the second part of the The second question? one is what do you enjoy? Oh gosh, a lot. Um, as you can see, uh, the, the meeting part, they're necessary, but I really love um, meeting with people, um, getting outside of the HEC when possible. I, sometimes I feel like we're on our little island there. I love to go across campus and meet with, you know, folks and just, again, get that diversity of thought, experience. Um, I can't say how much I really enjoy that. And yeah, I, I think Zoom is wonderful too. No offense to being on Zoom. This is a great way to connect people, but there's nothing better in my mind than the face-to-face. Uh, it's, and it's so interesting that you say that, um, and especially as one of the things that you enjoy, because I think I'm just the opposite. Oh, no. I'm like, do they want to meet in person? Why do they need to meet in person? We don't need to meet in person. <laughs> but I like now the difference is I like being at work. Yes. Um, I like going to events and different things like that. But when it's when it's meetings specifically like and for me, I think it's the one on one meetings. Sure. I'd rather just do one on one meetings on Zoom. Uh, but I laugh with the, the the surprises of how many meetings, because that's the same. When I took this role, I couldn't believe how many meetings. And as you said, the expectation that then you still have to get the work done. Right. So um, and I don't know if you've done this. And I, I tell everyone um, I started and I try to I, I stay on VP Solomon for this all the time. But I started blocking my calendar. And so Tuesday is my no meeting day unless it's an sure. emergency. I try not to put any meetings on Tuesdays and everyone wants to take them. And, and the hardest thing is telling people no. Yes. yes. Telling people no on Tuesdays that I got other days of the week for you, but I can't give you Tuesday. And, I, and that has been a challenge for me. And so in that, Dr. Warner, what I will ask you is how do you maintain self-care, especially when we're talking about being a Black woman in diversity, equity, and inclusion work, being at a historically predominantly white institution. And we know the reality is that we deal with microaggressions. We deal with bias. Um, we, we deal with, and not only within or not only with outside or outside of the race, but often amongst each other is that, you know, there are these, these conflicts that exist in terms of what direction you should or should not go. So, so how do you maintain this self-care for you? So I'm not going to say it's easy. Um, I like your idea of blocking off a whole day. I don't know if I can do a whole day, but certainly parts of the day, I think, are very important for self-care. For me, um, my family they are my refuge, um, in addition to, obviously, um, I mentioned earlier, my faith. I think those are probably the two main areas that I try to, again, get affirmed, get that extra dose of love. Um, but it's a challenge. It really is. The HEC is good, though, for um, exercise. There are a lot of steps. So that <laughs> helps me. Um, I walk around in circles on the third floor a lot, um, and I'm actually able to have meetings on the phone that way, but also getting my my steps in. And, and that's another way I like to uh, have time to to walk and um, be able to gather my thoughts. Yeah. And those steps are those stairs are treacherous <laughs> um, as well as you can lift weights if the automatic door goes out. And oh, that's true, to too. Try to open the door to get into the HEC. Absolutely. Well, I will tell you, Dr. Burton, it has been repaired. Uh, the the part <laughs> arrived from Europe and now that door is, is working. So, yeah. That's great because I was like, this is the heaviest door I have ever tried to open in my entire life. Um, so uh, there was a question that kind of came in. Um, it just recently came in, but it ask about your family and the identity of your sure. siblings. And so do your siblings identify as Black also? Yes, they do. So the, the responder in the chat wanted to ask that question. But then we have another one. Dr. Warner, as a sociologist, were your views about the social, what are, were your views about the social construct of race shaped by your lived experiences? 
And if so, how? Absolutely. Um, and I remember as a grad student, actually, in um, the sociology department, I taught a course, I think it actually may still be on the books, Race and Ethnic Identities, I believe was the title. It was my first course. And in the beginning of the course, I talk about the social construction of race. And this was the early, it was actually, I, I believe, two. 2000 or 2001 at the time. And that wasn't well received. And so we had to go back to some historical uh, information. But absolutely, I would say my lived experience has shaped that. But I also think it's interesting and fascinating to see how the science, if you will, has evolved in that area, too. Um, so as a graduate student, I remember there was uh, a guest speaker who had come. And I, I'm going to have to look up and see who it, who, it, who it was, because for me, it was wonderful to see someone who was in, you know, as we refer to the hard sciences, right? This was a person who was an expert in genetics, and he talked about the fact that he and a white colleague, that in fact his white colleague had more African um, heritage or, or genes than he did. And when we think about that and also think about how we kind of just based on a person's skin tone um, or color, melanin in their body, um, it's equivalent to just, you know, colors of of cars, if you will, or, or other things. Um, so that's a long way to answer yes. <laughs> no, that was not a long way. I mean, I think because for some people on the call, they may not even understand the social construct when we talk about race being a social construct. So I think it the way that you explained it gives a little bit more explanation of understanding what that even means. Um, so the next couple questions are going to take us back to your role in terms of that DEI, that wonderful world of diversity, equity, and inclusion that we now are being trained to say all of the words so that we don't minimize the work. Yes. So how do you measure success in um, the diversity, equity, and inclusion space at the nursing school? Wow. That's a tough one. And I say that because, you know, we have measurable outcomes and I, I refer a lot to VP Solomon's four C's, right? The community, culture, climate. Um, I'm all, I always miss curriculum. This. Thank you. <laughs> and so, for instance, one of our goals is to increase underrepresented minority students, staff, and faculty. So, having an increase from where we are, that would be deemed a success. Um, the fact that next month we will be opening a room at the health or Sampson Pavilion for individuals who need accommodated testing to have a space for our neuro neurodiverse students so they don't have to go across campus to the Oates office. I think that's a success. But also little successes, if you will, not necessarily those are big, but I don't tend to, I think any movement is success. So seeing a face at an event that we may not have seen before or someone who normally isn't available makes themselves available because for some reason, it's important to them and maybe it wasn't. So to me, that's a success. So to me, it's really a range. There are a lot of things that I can look at to say they're successes. Um, but do we have you know, a strategic plan? We're actually going to be meeting later this week to talk about we have all those formal things. But in my mind, I think success can be somewhat subjective because, you know, again, I'm thrilled if a student says something, someone, you know, brings something up in class that was mentioned or, or they were touched a certain way. So 
<laughs> and I'm laughing, I'm giggling to myself because I'm thinking I'm happy if we can just get people to hire an underrepresented minority faculty. Uh, <laughs> if we can just get them to, to hire, then, you know, you, you measure success differently, especially in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. But I will say that in our, uh, if you go to our website, I think the PDF is on there. As Dr. Warner is featured in our annual report in the 2022 annual report for some of the work that has been done in the nursing school. So you can find... Um, that within that book, as well as other DEI efforts that have that are happening on campus. Um, and so this is another question along the lines of that role. What is your priority goal that you aspire to accomplish in your new role? And what is the change that you hope to see in the next five years? So, and I actually alluded to this earlier um, when I said that, uh, what I the loan I took out my uh, first semester at Case was more than my entire undergraduate career. I have a vision um, that at some point our office would be able to provide some kind of assistance, financial assistance to students. Um, one of the priorities that's important, uh, particularly for nursing, is a pathway for. Um, our students so that we can have a more diverse workforce so that we can treat patients who are diverse. And that's where I, that's one area um, that if I had to name a, a goal, I would like to see that. But first, obviously, you have you have to grow. Um, and so we're working on different initiatives to receive grant funding to hopefully make some of those things a reality. Um, your office, as a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Solomon wrote a wonderful letter in support. We received a small educational uh, grant, um, a learning collaborative grant from the Macy Foundation to focus on anti-racism in nursing curricula. Again, that's something that's very much needed and at the basis of a lot of the work that we do. Mm -hmm. So seeing that not only for what we do at FPB, but also kind of beyond our walls. Yeah, I love that. And I, I think, you know, I always think about diversity, equity, and inclusion and thinking about, you know, what change do we want to see in the next five years? I'd say different than it is today. <laughs> If we can move beyond where we are today, then then change is happening. And and the great change would be is that if we when we really take diversity into um, into view, is that as an institution, our faculty numbers would match our student population. And, and we yes. would truly say we can, we, we honor diversity because we would just have that representation to match what our student body is. Um, so as we kind of come to a close and, and shifting, uh, we, we have a few minutes left. I wanna talk more about Dr. Warner. And what is it that Dr. Warner likes to do? Well, I like to spend time with my family. Like I said, I like to laugh. Um, a lot of what we deal with in this space is heavy and it's emotion fueled, right? And people have very strong feelings. So I try to have a little humor. I um, think that was something really that my parents uh, taught me as well, that you can talk about the tough things, you can do the tough stuff, the work that has to be done, but you also have to be able to laugh at yourself and find humor um, sometimes where you wouldn't expect it. So, you know, my kids make me laugh, my husband make me, I make myself laugh by some of the silly stuff that I end up doing um, or places I, I end up putting myself in. I just would say family, you know, is, is probably the best answer in terms of the things I like to do. Of course, I, I still love to read, although my reading is pretty much dedicated to the work I do, but I enjoy it. Yeah. So, but it, you know, it's still fun to, to look at um, scary movies now and then. That's the shocker for some people. I do. That's been kind of a 
an escapist thing for me. But yeah, probably spending time with family. Yeah, I love it. And, and, and you, we've had, you know, personal conversations. So I know that family is very important to you. Um, one question that I wanted to ask that I did that I just thought about that I didn't ask when we were actually along those lines are um, earlier is why stay at Case Western Reserve? You oh, did your PhD oh here and then you stayed. Why stay? Yeah, I did. Um, so I, I tell people I was a student. I received actually my master's and PhD. Um, I was a staff member for many years. I was a project director, Dean Musil's grant. And I thought, you know, that's that's kind of where I want to be. I just want to do be a, a staff person and do research. Um, and then, of course, my mentor, May Weichel, Dean Weichel, the first and only African-American dean, said, hey, why don't you try this faculty thing? So I so I did. And it's just a place, I would say, the people and the connections. Um, of course, we have wonderful scholars and researchers and, you know, staff and students. So all of just the whole package um, to me has really kept me here. Um, and there, you know, was a time where I wasn't here and I thought that part of my life was over. And I was wrong about that. Um, and I just, I would say I would say that the people and to me that in, that kind of covers not only the work I do but it, but it, it brings a certain aspect that I think a lot of people don't get yeah in their profession or in their job yeah, I, I I comment on that very often when people ask me, how is my experience at Case Western Reserve? And I said, well, never judge my experience based on someone someone else's or um, use mine to, to say what someone else is like. I said, because I have a great group of people that I work with. And because I have a great group of people that I work with and I'm surrounded by great people, then my experience is good. But not everybody at the institution has that experience. Uh, and so I think like you said, that, you know, we've been blessed to be around people that are great to work with and it helps us to navigate the institution. And so we are at our time. And I want to say, if you can give me one word that describes Dr. Warner? One word? Patient. I would agree. <laughs> I would definitely agree on that one. And Dr. Warner, I thank you. And I don't know before thank I you. Can, if you have anything else that you want to share with our audience or say before I close out and turn it back over to Tierra. I just want to thank everybody um, who, you know, joined us tonight because you could have done something else, but you're here and I appreciate you all. And um, I just want to thank you, Dr. Burton and Dr. Solomon. When I assumed this role, you two embraced me and, and helped me navigate in ways I will always um, appreciate you for. So I just want to you know, acknowledge you as well as those folks who are on this call, you all mean something to me in unique ways. And I just, I'm thankful and I'm grateful. Thank you. And we are so glad to have you. The institution is much a much better place because Dr. Camille Warner is a Case Western Reserve. So oh, we just thank you. thank you for being here. We thank you for um, working with us. Uh, you've you've done a lot of things in the School of Nursing, and very often it's behind the scenes. And so people don't know all of the work that goes into diversity, equity, and inclusion behind the scenes that's just not out front. So thank you for all of your hard work. I thank you all for listening this evening, and I will be turning it back over to Tierra. All right. Thank you, Dr. Burden. Thank you, Dr. Warner. Thank you to everyone for joining us on this evening. We appreciate you. And thank you to the Office um, for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusive Engagement. We are so grateful that everyone could be here with us today. 
mark your calendars and don't forget because we have another one coming up. So we hope to see you for our next Profiles of Inclusive Excellence. And that is on March 26th with Dean Dexter Voisin. So we hope that you are able to join us. Um, also, before we wrap up, shameless plug, um, but you can always find out more information about the African-American Alumni Association um, on the CASE website. Um, if you go to case.edu slash alumni, and you can follow us on Facebook and you can just search Case Western Reserve University, African-American Alumni Association. One more shameless plug because something really exciting is happening on campus. Um, and that's the reinstatement of the um, Case Western Reserve University chapter of the NAACP. Um, and that is led by the Department of Focus Outreach and the Office of Government and Community Relations. Um, so this initiative strengthens the university's commitment to social justice and more details about how Quade will be involved um, will be coming soon. So stay tuned for some exciting updates there. Um, so with that, thank you again for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful evening and we hope to see you next time.